Uh, welcome back. And uh, we we'll begin the discussion uh, around the state of the economy with agriculture, the value chain. We talked about this earlier in the morning, talking about how we can expand it and find ways people can get involved in agriculture. Because um, if you look at the statistics for the NBS, which was pushed out uh, a couple of weeks ago, you'll find out that the level of unemployment, even though it's at 33.3%, the numbers of people who are underemployed are unemployed, many of them who are women, many of them you find in the agricultural sector. Uh, we will find out that many of them haven't been able to expand the potentials within the industry, which has been the, the greatest misfortune for all of us. That sets the framework for today's conversation we would have with uh, an expert in the value chain for agriculture as well as a farmer uh, in the poultry um, section of agriculture. You can always join the conversation on social media, Silbert uh, News 24, hashtag News Hub. Um, talk with us. We'd love to hear what you think about uh, today's discussion. Uh, Emiri Emeka is the agricultural value chain expert, and he joins us this fine morning to help us understand how the agricultural value chain can be improved. Morning, Emeka. If you can hear yeah, us. Yeah, good morning. Uh, uh, nice to be on the news of show. Brilliant, brilliant. And I'm sure you have a lot for us to learn uh, today. So first and foremost, tell us what you make of um, the value chain for agriculture in the country as we speak. Uh, what have you seen? What is the state of agriculture when you look at uh, the value chain uh, across board? Um, okay, uh, not to be a pessimist, but I would, I would likely start by saying that um, in the Nigerian agricultural value chain today, um, we are seeing a lot of motion without movement. Uh, in the sense that um, you can hardly solve problems by throwing money at them which is essentially how I summarize a lot of the efforts uh, of the government today. A lot of money is being thrown to the agricultural sector, in quotes, um, Anchor Borrowers Program, the NISAL Agricultural Financing. But um, you can never really grow what you don't measure. So um, there has not been a very, very deliberate effort to measure and understand first before trying to um, solve um, what the problems are. So um, I would say that um, the Nigerian agricultural sector today has huge potentials, very, very huge potentials. But um, if the problems that face it um, are going to be solved, care has to be taken to really, really isolate what the problems are, and then go about solving it in a very, very intelligent uh, manner. For the layman watching us, the question will be that what is actually, when we talk about agricultural value chain, what do we mean? Can you please expand shade on that? Okay. So when we talk about the agricultural value chain, we talk about all the activities that happen um, from the time where you make preparations to when the actual product gets to the consumer. So the agricultural sector talks about um, from the inputs, um, all the little, little items that you use to do production, whether it is feed, whether it is uh, fertilizers, um, all that going down to production, going down to distribution, going down to value addition, going down to packaging and getting it to the final consumer. All that makes up the agricultural value chain. So it's not really just about production um or one part of um the uh agricultural value chain everything that happens in between from when preparation starts to when the final consumer gets the product that um, is what the agricultural value chain is made up of right and so the different actors you have um playing their roles there if you're going to say what for the farmer um, will be the lowest hanging fruit. Because oftentimes when we look at policy, you're probably looking at what we can do today, what we can do tomorrow and then in the future. For today, the average farmer has so many things going through his or her mind on how to get things moving very quickly. 
Um, which of the areas would you say, for example, will be a quick win uh, in terms of what you've seen on the ground that would help uh, an everyday farmer in the country? Okay. Um, first of all, let's let's look at um, some. Let's look at this things from three lenses. One, uh, I like to I like to look at this from a, a problem and a potential quick win and how it can be addressed. So, for starters, let's look at um, the issue of post harvest losses. Um, Forty to sixty percent of everything that is produced in the country today is wasted. It is more rife in um, um, the vegetable uh, value chain and then gets lower as you go to the other value chains. Now, uh, for something like that, um, one way to start solving those problems, aside from investment in critical storage and um, value addition infrastructure, to understand what the industry needs so that farmers are producing exactly what um, is required by um, industry. So it's like um, a market-driven a market -driven approach to understand okay, this is what the industry wants. This is what I should produce. Once farmers do that, it's going to be a quick win for them. So, for instance, it makes no sense for a farmer um, to just go in and produce any type of cassava. He should look at what variety should I produce that has very, very huge market potential that will ensure that whatever I produce, there is you know, a captive market for it. Um, so if a farmer um, is surrounded by starch companies and produces just any kind of um, cassava, he is going to have a hard time trying to sell it um, compared to if he actually produces TMS 419, which has a high starch content. That makes it possible for him to have a guaranteed market for his cassava. So that approach um, to producing for the market is something that can be a very quick win for smallholder farmers, yeah? Um, aside maybe investment in critical um, storage and post-harvest handling infrastructure. Then, secondly, um, there is the area of the use of precision production. Um, crops, crop yields, uh, if, if, I, if I were to zero in on crops, uh, yields are quite very, very poor at the moment. And most production is done at a very fragmented level to the extent that it becomes very difficult to invest in mechanisms to come together as cooperatives and actually produce uh, in a sort of mini commercial farm stock using in clusters. This allows sufficient investment in mechanization. So somebody who has a tractor to lease will be more comfortable transporting a tractor to a, a site location if he's going to plow like 50 hectares um, as against if he's just going there um, to plow one acre or two acres, which is usually the size that most um, smallholder farmers, you know, farm. That um, makes it possible for farmers to achieve uh, uh, more yield and, you know, produce more, especially if they are using data to understand what the soil needs and how to go about applying their fertilizers. All right, Emeka, all that you've said so far would suggest that maybe there are a lot of challenges being faced uh, within the agricultural uh, chain, so to speak. What would you say uh, the value chain has been faced with, the different challenges uh, that we have presently? Okay, um... I think chief of these uh, challenges uh, um, uh, with the uh, a little challenge in there. I was asking the question with regards to challenges. Hope we reconnect with him in a short while so they can give us more insight 
into uh, our discussion this morning. We're taking a look at agricultural value chain. Uh, the challenges, you know, most of the times, uh, however, when we talk about agricultural value chain, people will be like, okay, the easiest way is from the moment of thinking about even going to agriculture itself, yeah. so of, of getting seeds, of planting, and getting uh, to develop the mechanism, methodologies mm. deployed mm. in uh, agricultural developments in the country. Mm. And just as we've had a lot of reports, hope we even bring one on the show, where the prices of food items in the markets... <laughs> I, I don't know how to define it. Yeah. It's going up and up. And so this time, what we should be talking about, COVID-19 is there, no doubt about it, is the fact that if we don't pay a very huge attention, yeah. I hope that we don't get run into right. food crisis in the country uh, because we need to be able to sustain ourselves. And that's, that's the challenge we're faced with. I hear that Emeka is back with us. Emeka, so nice to have you back with us on the show. So before the line went, or before the, we missed you on the uh, in just a few moments ago, you were talking about the challenges faced uh, in Nigeria when it comes to agricultural value chain. Can you continue on your line of thought? Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's really nice to be back. I'm sorry for the disruption. It's what we farmers face. Um, uh, when you are in uh, rural locations with limited connectivity like this, uh, you can have these disruptions. But I was going to say, um, to look at the challenges, uh, let me put things in perspective. Um, the average yield for maize in Nigeria today is about 1.2 tons per hectare. Globally, the average yield for the same maize is 3 tons per hectare. Now, um, that is not, that's global yield average, but that's not even to compare with um, what is possible. You know, you can achieve seven to 10 tons per hectare. That shows you the level of inefficiency, the level of suboptimal yield that is obtainable. And that is because most times when farmers are producing, there is a mismatch between um, the soil condition and the inputs the farmers are using. Um, whereas there are several solutions that exist, um, it's it's very difficult for the farmer because uh, to, to assess those things because of their low purchasing power. Um, so those, those low yields are a huge problem. And these are things that need to be fixed yesterday, not even today. Because uh, when we talk about food security, we talk about affordability, we talk about accessibility. When all those boxes are not ticked, that's going to be a huge problem for the country. Now, uh, the second area is in the area of uh, monitoring, measurements, um, extension, and good agri practice knowledge. Now, in the country today, we have a lot of knowledge in the research institutes and all that, but it's just a few of that knowledge that gets trickled back to the farmer. And that's because of a huge gap that exists. Um, for instance, um, the ratio of farmer to extension workers as of today is one is to 7,000. That is, there is one extension farmer, one extension worker to 7,000 farmers. That is grossly inadequate. So the knowledge that is supposed to trickle down to the farmer doesn't get down to the farmer. So um, when they cannot have new ways, new methods, new improved ways of doing things get to them. It's a huge problem. There is also the issue of inadequate storage. Now, um, all these things are sort of also opportunities, opportunities for um, the private sector um, to invest in beyond um, the same cyclical approach of um, throwing money at things. I think it's an area that needs very, very huge improvement. Um, again, um, I think also that the uh, market linkages to the farmer is something that needs to be worked with very, very deliberately. And in fact, um, Emeka, the, the picture you paint um, gets more complex when I think of the different angles. We're just dealing with the basic 
the, from the basic fundamentals. We haven't even gotten to the agro-allied, for example, to say this is where we can take it up to. We're dealing with storage, we're dealing with logistics, and um, just the basic heat, um, issues, post-harvest loss. What, what would you say? Because um, uh, you got me thinking about the, when you talk about the number of farmers to extension workers, I mean, it's grossly inadequate, one to 7,000. And we expect that they move from subsistence farming to other areas of farming, mechanized farming and, you know, and other areas. But there's not enough time for us to get things happening. What have you seen from the point you are in terms of where the farms are? They are the, uh, the state level. Uh, whether there's anything that has caught your attention in the way things are being done to improve uh, the situation, or is it more of frustration on your part when you see what uh, they are trying to do to improve uh, those numbers in terms of how people move from subsistence uh, towards mechanized farming? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, in my opener, I said something, and I still want to backtrack to it. I said that um, you, you don't solve problems by throwing money at them. It is quite heart-wrenching when you see that truly, perhaps, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, the CBN, and all the stakeholders um, really want to solve the problems in the agricultural sector. But um, I sincerely believe that they are going about it the wrong way. And you seldom are going to be able to improve what you don't measure. And that's the state of things right now. So essentially, you get funds. Um, you provide those to the farmers. But a lot of effort is not made to really measure outcomes. So at the end of the day, what is the farmer getting? How, how can you improve what the farmer is doing today? So, um, so, so for instance, my company, um, we have a platform that um, can enable um, farmers to not just know um, what the nutrient deficiency is in the soil, but also know how to apply and use the best inputs and fertilizers so that they achieve um, best results. In addition, over time, you can also carry out um, plant health analysis to understand what is happening with the crops. So what that means is that for farmers who work, they can easily measure what is happening on the farm. They can come back and say, OK, this is the state. This is what I need to do. This is how to improve. That measurement for me is what is lacking. So um, if, you, if you supported X, Y, Z number of farmers on this value chain, what was their total output? Um, it, 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 at least I'm in this space, and I've seen a lot of things. Um, uh, for instance, a few years back, um, out of over, um, I think, over 5,000 or 7,000, I can't be sure about the figure now, I was having a conversation with the then Commissioner of agri Kano State, who happens to be the Deputy Governor now, and he was telling me a challenge they had. Out of the number of farmers that the state shorted, um, only about three or five were able to pay back. But the very next year, these same funds will be thrown to farmers without saying this is what this one Naira was able to achieve. That is a waste of taxpayers' money. That is a total waste. If you are putting money into a sector, you have to go about it very, very intelligently. First of all, where is this funds going? What is it going to achieve? Did it achieve what we set out to achieve? And the only way to do that is to say, okay, I want to invest in the maize value chain. Um, so maybe I'm partnering with Afex Commodities Exchange, who are going to pick this thing up. So how do I make sure that, one, the people who I am giving this to are adequately trained? How will I make sure that I monitor outcomes at the end of the day so that I know where to improve? If this is not done this way, we will continue to go round and round and round in cycles. We will do a lot of motion, but no movement. Sincerely. 
that will be joined in the studios now uh, by Godwin Egbebe, Chairman, Poultry Association of Nigeria, the Lagos State Chapter. Uh, Godwin, it's so nice to have you on this house. Thank you. So nice to have you on the show. Uh, so what's, what's been, uh, especially with these COVID-19 issues in the country, how would you describe Nigeria's agricultural uh, uh, value chain in the last one year, putting into consideration your expectations before even the year 2020 and where we are presently? Well, um, thank you. Uh, I think uh, every sector in the nation has been affected and um, food security is being threatened as we speak. Even before the lockdown or the COVID-19, the agricultural sector has been suffering because we're having increase in the price of raw materials because that's the bane of the, of the whole business. The raw materials form the basis. So without raw materials, or maybe they are increasing raw materials, it will affect the whole value chain. Mm. So right now, there's going to be a problem in food security. Mm. So we are on the learning curve with you, and one uh, 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 Mary Mecca, uh, who is a value chain agricultural expert. And um, if uh, anyone who is an avid listener is, and viewers watching today and asking, for example, you give us the outlay of what the value chain for, uh, for the poultry industry looks like. You, you could give us a summary, we'd love to hear. Well, when we talk about uh, the value chain in the poultry, we have a long list of them. Mm. Starting from the hatchery, where the chicks comes out from. Then you also have uh, those that produce the grains. That the farmers that produce the grains. Uh, they, you have uh, uh, maize, you have uh, soya, we have wheat tofa. You also have the micronutrients. Most of them are imported anyway. Mm. So uh, those are part of it. You also have drugs that the birds take. Then you also have uh, the probiotics, which also belong to the drug uh, area. Then you have people that now produce this chicken. Either they are producing eggs or they are producing meat. Then you also have those that are into processing of this, uh, of this uh, meat. Uh, uh, products, then you also have those that are into packaging. You also package this meat. Then you also have those that in that same value chain, you have those that haul the products. You have the refrigerating uh, vans. They have their blast freezers. As soon as the thing is being processed, they take them to the blast freezers, package them, and uh, take it out to shops or wherever they want to retail them. Then you also have, in that same value chain, you have the, those that are in egg production. Mm. They produce their own is solely to produce eggs. You also have in that same value chain, those that are into marketing. They market the products. So we have a lot. And what, there are some other areas, again, in the value chain that we are not even exploring, which is the egg powder. Oh. Because most of these uh, people that does uh, all the beverages and the likes, confessionaries, they add eggs oh. to their products. And you cannot add that egg in the raw stage. You have to process it to powder. Because even you are producing a beverage, you know beverage are always uh, in the powder form or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. You cannot add egg in the raw stage. You have to process it to powder. Which nobody, I don't think anybody is doing it in the country as we speak. Mm -hmm. And they use a lot in billions of dollars every year in Nigeria. Wow. So we, are not, we have not even explored that area yet. Okay. So we have a lot in the value chain. That All right. you, you mentioned that even before the uh, coming of COVID-19, the agricultural sector, it's very, the value chain had been under some uh, dire straits. Yep. Uh, what were those challenges and how relevant are they in present day terms? Uh, are there things being done in that regard? How are you trying to surmount such uh, challenges? Um, well, one of them is, um, like I said, the greens is the basis. As we speak, Nigeria is not uh, sufficient in grain production because the technology 
is not there. When you say grains, which of the grains are you talking Maize about? and soya. Okay, thank Maize you. Maize and soya, those are the two major uh, materials used in produ producing uh, the feed for the birds. So we have some countries are achieving maybe like uh, uh, maybe six tons per hectare. Nigeria is still doing about 2.53 per, per acre, hectare. So you see that we are not yet in that level of uh, uh, full uh, production in terms of maximizing space that we have. So all these are things that research is supposed to do, but I know that a lot of research has been done, but there are no links between the, 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 the production or the producers and the institutes that uh, produce uh, these uh, materials mm. in terms of research. Mm. So there need to be a link. When you, when you do your research, you need to take it to, the, to, the, to, the, to those that are producing so that they can utilize it. Right. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Gordon McBeg. We're going to come back to you uh, briefly. Let's, let's get back to Mecca uh, uh, Chiamere, who is an um, uh, agricultural value chain expert. And um, certain things, Mecca, that um, um, Gordon has talked about, um, I, I like the way he ended about the, the linkage. And it's something that we found out hap has happened over and over again, where institutes, universities of technology, uh, universities of agriculture, do a lot of stuff, but there is no linkage between what happens in the classroom and what happens on the field. So the value chain isn't exactly a chain, it's, it's broken pieces of iron uh, we're trying to fit together uh, in, in different spaces. What, what are the factors that have been responsible for this breakage in the linkage between one uh, aspect of the chain with another aspect of the chain, for example, research and what happens in the field? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, before I go to that question, let me, let me quickly add to something uh, Mr. Gordon uh, mentioned. Um, he, he, he was saying um, that we are production levels for grain is actually low because we don't have the technology. Um, that's, that's not really the picture per se. The at the agricultural value chain and how far we're going as a nation, knowing fully well that every nation that wants to stay healthy and fine must have the food security. That's what we're taking a look at this morning on the show. Let's come back to the studios and speak with Godwin. Godwin, um, let's break it down to the way that we are. Uh, the price of birds in the, in the, in the market, like, okay, we get them as protein directly, so we don't see them in the form of where they have the feathers, yeah. all of those things. The, the value chain will have passed through so many processes before it gets to the market, to the supermarket where we pick them from, uh, so to speak. As we speak in the country, do you think enough is being done to address the challenges that we have? Bearing in mind that we have some things, it's even good for birds because, I mean, maybe you can, when you get your feet, you can feed them. But some other food items in the country is dependent on some areas that specialize in producing them. As we speak, is there any improvement um, in terms of government policies, in terms of even individuals, perhaps cooperative societies, so to speak, in the country, towards bringing, uh, maximizing the uh, potentials of the agricultural sector in the country? Well, um... I think Nigeria is not uh, alien or maybe we are not uh, short of ideas or policies. We have more than enough policies, but the willpower to drive it to the grassroots. That's, what, that's the problem we are having. You hear that uh, government is supporting the agricultural sector with X amount of billions, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get to the grassroots. You've never gotten any grant before? we have never gotten any grant. You. So me, we. when I say yes, I'm talking about when I'm talking about I'm the chairman of uh, the Putra Association, Lagos State. Mm -hmm. The only grant that I know that we have gotten, or maybe support, is from the appeals, the World Bank uh, program, collaboration with uh, Lagos State and some other states, mm -hmm. which I know that our members are getting some uh, reliefs mm -hmm. in terms of uh, support. So, by and large. 
that support is just like uh, a drop of water in the ocean. What can that do? So if things like that are happening, there has to be a kind of continuity mm. so that the farmers can. Because as we speak, the uh, ash free producers, they increase their prices. I don't know why they do that, whether it's because of the power, because they have to power their generator 24 hours. They have to power their machines 24 hours, whether that is the cost or whether it's the cost of feed. But this increase is too, I mean, frequent. Also the feed millers. So we as the poultry association members, we haven't thinking of having a stakeholders meeting with them. Mm. What is the reason? Because Nigerians, they like taking advantage. Like when they say, oh, there's yeah, going to be an increase in fuel. Yeah. Even before the increase, people have started increasing their prices. Mm. So those are some of the issues that we are facing. Mm. So there is no way you can plan in this industry. And we are, we are the, the, the receiving end, all the suffering, mm. because especially those that are producing eggs, you know, eggs are perishable goods. You don't right. keep them for too long. Right. And these buyers, they know, especially the middlemen. Mm. They know that you can't keep them for so long, so they will leave you. They say, okay, let's see. Mm. You are producing, maybe, you are producing uh, 200 every day. Mm. And the best, you cannot tell the best to stop laying. They keep laying. And the, the, your, the numbers keep increasing. And you know you can't keep them for so long. So you will be forced to sell at a ridiculous price, even at loss. loss. And that's what is happening. So that's why we are clamoring. We need government support in terms of doing this, uh, what's it called, this egg powder machine. Right. So that at least we can mop some of these eggs, right. SS eggs to those right. machines and uh, turn them to powder, which can mm -hmm. last for a very long time. Thank you very much, Gordon Ogbebe, because it just cements a point which was made earlier. We'll get back to um, Emeka Wanchimere, an agricultural value chain expert, about if you increase the yield, it's where you can begin to see the profit happen and then branch into other areas, which is where the future most likely is for uh, the, uh, our culture in this country. So, Emeka, you're going to respond to some of the things that Gordon Ogbebe had said, and then you're also going to respond to the factors that have not allowed the linkage of the chain across uh, the country's um, uh, agricultural sector in different areas. Uh, take poultry, for example. But go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, as I was saying before, I, I got cut off. Uh, um, so it, it's not necessarily a thing about lack of, of technology or know-how or research. We do a lot of research. I've been to a lot of research level of knowledge that was there, buried and gathering dust. Um, as I said, the farmer to extension worker ratio is grossly inadequate. There has to be a way to make sure and to, to ensure that that knowledge, that know-how is translated from the desk to the field. And you can't do that without an effective extension um, system. Now, um, even if we don't want to go the approach of having a labor-intensive process, um, we can also leverage technology to deliver this. However, um, given the level of unemployment, one would think this would be a very, very great area to you know, fix things, um, to create employment opportunities. Um, another thing to you know, look at is the fact that uh, according to recent data, we have about 64 million smallholder farmers. But the real question is, where are these farmers? What are they producing? Where are they producing it? And I'm, I'm trying to speak to the lack or the depth of um, data. Um, it is data that makes it very, very possible to affect those linkages that we talk about. When I know, for instance, that, oh, I have X, Y, Z number of poultry farmers in this area of Lagos State, it can help me to plan. You can't plan without data. You can't improve without data. About uh, increase in prices of feed. The truth is that, for instance, when you look at something like feed, several dynamics are affected. Um, but the major cost to feed is actually the raw materials. Now, if I, as a farmer, go and I buy fertilizer at high cost, 
Um, right now, sometimes um, you, you can't even find the fertilizer to buy. Some people um, buy it, hoard it, and keep it, and, and, and you know, create artificial scarcity in this space. And when that happens, farmers end up buying this thing at very, very exorbitant cost. When they do that, and my cost of production has increased, you don't expect me to sell at less than cost, which even happens sometimes. Now, secondly, we don't have adequate storage. So if I, I as a farmer, produce grains, I am forced to sell off, right? No matter what quantity I produce, whatever I don't sell gets wasted because I don't have adequate storage, you know, to store it. So if we are not investing in adequate storage, it would be foolhardy to even talk about increasing, you know, production because it has to be linked. What you produce has to be stopped. Then, of course, we talk about economies of scale and cost of production. If I'm producing on one acre, two acres, one hectare, my cost of production is going to be infinitely higher because I'm not going to be able to use mechanization. But if I'm producing um, on a large scale, what it means is that I can then use mechanization. I can use boom sprayers to reduce my cost, to reduce the time, and time is money, that it takes me to produce these things. So I can produce more with less. So it is only when all these things is fixed that I can produce optimally. And then when the feed compounder buys from me, he, he buys at prices that allow him to offer this thing to the poultry farmer at you know, reduced prices. But then again, if essential items like um, concentrates that are added to the feed have to be imported, and we have several regimes for foreign exchange, of course, that is going to add up to um, that. These are areas we need to be encouraging the private sector to come in. We cannot afford to keep importing things that are very, very essential when we have all it takes to produce it within the country. All right, Mecca, thank you so much. Very, very profound what you just uh, said right now. Let's come back to the studios. Godwin, I want to take you up on your, your last statement before uh, we went to uh, Emeka there. You, you're talking about the need to get machines or perhaps equipment, let me put it that way, to make the value chain be more optimal when it comes to the opportunities that are bound, especially in, in poultry farming in the country. I know that there are a couple of banks, some nationally owned, some others, a size World Bank, that assist. How easy is it to get credit facilities to fund uh, the value chain, especially when it has to do with uh, uh, storage, which was what uh, Mick also mentioned just a while ago? Um, bank institutions in Nigeria, we know how they play. Even the central bank, which is uh, the big bank, or the banks, are the bank for all banks, That's which fine. is supposed to intervene, especially in agriculture. As we speak, it's very, very difficult for you to assess loan from the bank. Why? Because high cost, I mean, the interest rate is very high. And when you take a loan, and you know, like now they said they are giving uh, this SME loan, CBN, 10 million, and they even reduce it to even 5%. Even at that, I advise my members, you need to look at the pros and the cons. You need to look at how are you going to pay back this loan. It's not about taking the loan, maybe because it's 5%, you just want to jump into it. Mm -hmm. You take the loan, 5%, good. Now, how do you pay back? when cost of raw materials are not stable. As you mean, you know that the cost of raw material, maybe you are buying your maize at 160, and that will remain for a very long time. You cannot plan Come to pay on. back your loan. But you buy maize, you plan repayment of your loan at 160 per ton of maize. Mm. And now the maize now goes up to about 220, 230, as against 160. Mm. How do you pay back? Mm. So in the long run, People will now say that farmers are not uh, willing to pay back their loans. Which, which is, I know the argument with the bank and banking sector, and they had at some point said that all the banks should have a Greek desk yeah. because the complaint had been the, the regular bankers had no idea what was going on in the farms. Yeah. Uh, so they weren't fit to be able to say, for example, what should be the interest rate, which is part of a larger argument 
about how you discriminate credit for farmers or for, you know, because it's not what you would call profit yielding in the way you, for example, will give loans to businesses. So they, they don't discriminate uh, agric loans on a short term basis rather than long. So help me understand, are the 5% loans given on a short term basis, a maturity maximum five years, 10 years, or is, or is it on a long term basis? Well, it's on a long term basis. Say, for example, how many years? Maybe six years, oh, like which the one is that they are short doing. Short term, actually. Yes, which is, which is short term. <laughs> we can call that short term. <laughs> but if you give a loan to a farmer and the farmer knows that prices of his raw materials are stable, within less than that six years that you're talking about, the farmer will pay back. You understand what I'm saying? But when the, the prices of raw materials are not stable, there's no way the farmers can plan. That's just the bane of the whole issue. And talking about commercial banks, they might even tell you, that, okay, they are giving you a loan for 23%. But on the long run, you now see with all those hidden charges, mm. those loans will come to about 30 to 32%. Mm. Which you cannot, I mean, argue with them. They will say that you have to pay these charges, you have to pay these charges, you have to pay these charges, which was not disclosed to you at the initial I mean, uh, bagging. Mm. Oh. So that, those, are some of, those are some of the issues that we are facing. All right. Emeka, can I dip, put a, the same question across to you about the credit facilities available to farmers uh, to ensure that the value chain uh, remains very, very highly connected to improve productivity in the country? How easy? And also, have you ever been able to enjoy any form of grant, perhaps loans? Uh, what were the processes towards achieving such? Right, um, thank you very much for thank you very much for that question. Um, uh, personally, I think that um, in terms of let me start from the policy end of things. I think we are always going back and forth when it comes to finance and credit in in Nigeria. Um, we come up with wonderful uh, financial policy. Stay because I really want to hear your contribution. Is, but okay. execution right. leaves a lot to oh. be, that is too and very well. Yeah. So it's not easy for farmers to get uh, financing. And um, when you talk about commercial banks, indeed, truly, they were not really set up um, for that kind of financing. But I, I think to them um, that beyond you know, establishing a desk, there has to be, you know, effort to understand agriculture and the value chain. You can't give uh, somebody a loan and you say it's a, it's, it's a short term loan and the rates don't even allow the person to break even. Talk, talk, talk more of um, paying back. So it's quite very, very difficult getting uh, loans here for farmers. And more importantly, loans that allow the farmer to be effective. I'm not talking about loans by impute. So, so let's take something like um, the uh, poultry value chain. So I get up now and say, uh, I'm interested in creating uh, egg powders. And I go to a bank. And then they ask me, what's the total cost? I, I tell them. The next thing they ask me is... Um, What's your collateral? And you know, the, the, at the end of the day, you end up not being able to receive those loans because one, if, if you are, if you are foreign into that space for the first time, you, how likely is it that you are going to have collateral? So it's, it's a huge issue. Personally, I have um, tried. Um, in fact, um, one bank reached out reached out to us um, because um, our platform is always looking to see how, you know, we can uh, provide impute financing for smallholder farmers. And um, they reached out with the possibility of collaboration. Uh, but almost eight months later, um, nothing has come out of it. It's, it's still been, oh, we are looking to see, to get approval for this, to get approval for that. 
Now, by the time, uh, let's say you wanted to do invest in a particular area that is time bound, and you were banking on the banks to come to, uh, eight months is enough time for such to thank for you to, you know, you know, lose out on, on that. So I think um, the the some some discussions need to be had in terms of creating financial instruments that really are fine-tuned for agricultural production that really understands what the challenges are but those investments those finances should start from you know areas of you know de-risking production so for instance storage that we are talking about post-harvest handling infrastructure those are areas that will make it less risky for other areas you start from such areas um if there is storage and farmers you know produce and store there will be price stability for um a poultry feed compounder because what you are using is stored it's, 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 it's a stored grain so but if you don't have storage if there's not financing for that kind of areas you always have price volatility, which would make it um, risky for both the farmer and the bank that wants to now take um, uh, loans for production. Once you have, you know, functional um, services for storage, for value addition, like processing, um, egg powder production, and the likes, that is if we're zeroing on the poultry value chain. It makes the other the other spaces, the other parts of the value chain, to be less risky. Thank you. We'll take a quick break. Uh, we come back. Uh, Gordon McBeg, we're still here with us. Please stay with us on News Hub. The fight against COVID-19 is far from over. We are presently in the community transmission phase. Unfortunately, this is the most deadly part of its spread, and it's more prevalent in high-density areas. Don't become a statistic. Wash your hands frequently with soap and running water. Or use a hand sanitizer. And remember to practice physical distancing at all times and avoid crowded places. But if you have no choice, you have the choice of wearing a face mask. Remember, it's not over till it's really over. This is a message from the Silverbird Group. stories, insightful documentaries, news reports from around the globe, and original news content. Now available 24 hours daily on Star Times Channel 109. Stream live on YouTube at www.youtube.com forward slash Silverbird N24 Live. Follow on Facebook at Silverbird News 24, on Twitter at Silverbird N24, and on Instagram at Silverbird N24. Silverbird News 24, the news never stops. You can now stream Silverbird News 24 live on mobile app. All you need to do is to download Silverbird News 24 app from Google Play Store on your Android devices and App Store or on your Apple devices. Tap the live button at the bottom bar to watch us live 24-7. You can enjoy all our news programs including PJ News and Program. Silverbird News 24. The news never stops. Thanks for staying with us on News Hub. We're still taking a look at the agricultural value chain in the country. And we'll be talking about production, production, production. What about the consumers, you and I? And so during the break, I began a conversation with Mr. Godwin in the studios, and I would like to take it to our people at home. I, I, I complain about the fact that 
Many, we always preach eat Nigeria, wear Nigeria, do Nigeria. But some people complain that the taste of some, for instance, let me, your own constituency, which is uh, uh, poultry. poultry that's when you buy uh, poultry products, some poultry products in Nigeria, that they don't taste as fresh as they could. So you're trying to give me an explanation. Yeah. Um, you know, power is one of our issues in Nigeria. And there's a process. When you are into processing line, after cleaning the chicken, the feathering, and removing the, all the investor, the next thing you have to do is to take it to the blast freezer to keep it in that state, that fresh state. Less than five minutes, the blast freezer will blast it, and uh, the, the, the best are whole. Now, you now package it and go and refrigerate it. That's why I told you about, when you are talking about the value chain, yes. I told you that there are some people that are into haulage. They have their refrigerating vans. But some other people, they, don't, they cannot afford it. So they carry those chickens just the way they have processed it, just like that. Maybe to wherever they want to sell it. At that state, the thing starts deteriorating. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm trying to. Remember that uh, the Nigerian Customs Service, and we, we've had some of these important, you know, one thing that the federal government will say is that, they've banned frozen foods from coming into the country. Yeah. And most of us want to eat what's produced in our country. Yeah. Now you're trying to tell us that uh, some people would move their birds, uh, the, the, the protein without preservation. Is there anything being added? We hear that some terrible chemicals were being added to the imported frozen foods. Yes. What do you, how do you preserve, uh, you know, uh, poultry products in the country? That's what I'm saying. Just you take freeze it, it. You freeze it. You don't add anything. You don't add anything. Okay. That is why when you eat our own chicken, the taste is different. I remember one of my friends that visited my farm and we gave him a live chicken. After when the wife cooked, it, he now said he never knew that this is how chicken tastes because they have been eating a frozen chicken. You, you know, now, yeah, now you so understand what I'm said, trying to say. Yeah. Now because you just wonder what's going on. So that's on. it. And uh, those chicken that is small good, they can stay in the in the in the bush for three four days. Nothing happens to them because they are chemicalized. Mm. Mm. They use all these embalming uh, solutions to embalm them. And uh, you know, those things don't kill quickly like quickly. that. They are slow killers. That's why you go to the hospital, you see a lot of cancer of this and that. All those are the costs. So that's why our government needs to, because you are what you eat. Absolutely. So that's why when people come to our farm and they say they want to buy one crate of egg, they want to buy this, and my people will say, no, we don't have. I say, no sell to her or sell to him because they know the value other people they use our eggs especially in lagos we are producing lagos they use our eggs to sell other eggs from other states that comes in mm. because they know that our eggs are always fresh mm. all right good you've you've opened the pandora box is, i'm telling you the rogue <laughs> element in the value chain sometimes mm. yeah. that you will find across the different um, sectors but it's what it is it's what nigeria is and what we have to deal with uh, every time. Um, um, back to you in um, virtual, we're an agricultural value chain expert. When, when you look at the chain, um, there's so many people uh, you know, in, involved in it. You talked earlier about the number of farmers to extension workers, such a huge gap, and also means that there are opportunities. There are people who are watching today, you look at the unemployment level, 33%, throwing the underemployment, uh, another uh, 15 uh, 10, 10%, we're closing in on 50% underemployed and employed. And from what I gleaned with the conversations, we, we tend to uh, imagine that with large scale farming, mechanized farming, the opportunities are more. We can soak in more people from the unemployment market and get employed in the agricultural sector because it's expanded. But what it is, is from what you're saying, I'm going to big way saying we have more of the small scale guys doing stuff, very few large scale farming happening. Can this miracle still happen. The man who is watching, looking at the value chain, saying, are there opportunities for me to get involved and uh, become a farmer, either directly on the farms or through uh, the chain, logistics and all the different aspects of it? What are the prospects? Oh, OK. Um, thank you very much. First, um, to you know, lend more credence to what you said, um, 75% of all food production in the country is done by small holdings. That is, farmers who produce at very low scale. So, so 
That is to say that most of our production is done by smallholders. Now, are there opportunities? Yes. Now, let me, let me tell you a bit of... Um, my own story, how I got into this right, space. Um, I want to realize him, so I wanted to you know, get a new experience. Uh, my background was uh, mechanical engineering. I did my first farm. It was mechanized. They said give the land, but I, you know, uh, got the resources together. Maze, on a five hectare maize farm. Now, um, I realized that despite my best efforts, my youth were no, because there were other factors that determine um, efficiency and high yield production. Now, this includes um, having very valuable and seeds that match your soil. This is how to apply even the fertilizers um, because there are variable depletion zones on the farm. Now, um, that eventually was what set me on the path to doing what I do today through Keto Technology Company. Now, talking about opportunities, all these places where there are problems are opportunities for young people to create, um, to create, uh, you know, uh, something for themselves. So let me start with um, the issue of um, uh, extension. Now, a farmer is not likely to pay for extension today, except if there is another organization that is paying for the farmer because of their low purchasing power. However, um, there is a way that a young person can, you know, um, you know, sort of um, go around that. So if I am a young person and I identify a cluster of plenty farmers in a particular location, I train myself an extension. I, 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 you know, go through several materials to understand extension. I use it as a means of value addition for the farmers to provide other services to them. I go and understand what the best seeds are. I buy it and I resell to the farmers. They may not be able to pay for my extension, but it's a door opener for me to provide other services like providing them with quality seeds. I can, farmers are not literate enough to know how to use digital platforms like ours or um, to look for tractors, to look for, um, you know, fertilizers and all that. But I can intermediate for them. Right. At the same time, I can get information that says this is the best uh, kind of um, rice to grow. Let's say most of the mills are looking for farrow 54 and 56. So I get the seeds, grow it. And then at the end of the day, I create that market linkage. Doing that already, I'm creating an opportunity in the input space for myself. And I'm using extension as a Now, I can also. Um, you're going to have to maybe, you know, get some savings um, or get a loan, you know, if it exists. And then I go and I buy something like a, I buy something like a, a boom sprayer. And I have a cluster of farmers who depend on a lot of labor. And, and what is happening in that space right now is that we used to rely on a lot of Togolese and Benenoa people to do a lot of um, the manual spraying and all that. Now, a lot of them are not available, which is creating a problem right now. So if I were a young person, I could simply go buy a boom sprayer and then I lease it to farmers around and I make an income. I'm creating an opportunity. So a lot of the problems that exist in the agri space can be solved that way with young people creating um, income for themselves. But, um, you know, sometimes it appears like hard work, and it is what it is. Value chain and employment in the country. Let's bring it down to climate change. Uh, one very big factor that would affect agriculture all over the world is the climate. Uh, in this country now, I know for you that into poultry, I hear that there are some seasons where the birds may, you know, fall into some kind of. Uh, diseases we hope not so to speak how has your association and generally speaking those uh, poultry farmers in the country been able to cope with uh, climate change in the country well um in terms of uh, climate change 
vis-à-vis -vis our production, uh, our operation, as we may speak, is uh, the, what we do in very hot season. Because it's pretty hot now, the, the temperature yeah, what, is very high. What, what we do, what we advise our farmers to do is to make sure that you have blocks, high blocks, readily available at this very hot season. So you put it in your overhead tanks to make sure that the water is cool for the birds to take. And once the bird takes the cool water, it reduces their temperature. Sorry, how do you do that? I'm, I'm very curious. How do you... <laughs> you, it's ice block. Okay. Normal ice block. It's not as if the water is refrigerated from the source. No, 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 no. Oh, really? Ice block. Maybe you have a tank of maybe 5,000 liters. Okay. You can just put like maybe five or six ice block of reasonable size. Put it on the overhead tank. And uh, the water is cool for the best to take. As against the direct uh, sun that is eating your water and the best are. Mm -hmm. So the best will not want to take much. Yeah. And they are not taking much. It's going to affect. And some of them, because of their, the, the fat, underlining fat that they have, the thing might melt. And you will not start having mortality or prolapse or as it may, as it that, may that, be. That, 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 that's so but when you do that, you, you, then people that uh, are well-to-do farmers, they can also put in uh, some fans. Some industrial okay, fans. Industrial fan. yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the? I'm sorry. Uh, what about the deployment of ICT? Does it work in the poultry sector? The what? Is there anything uh, that information technology are uh, that things that that uh, is been able to do in helping uh, your yields, maybe your operations, how things move in the poultry agriculture? Uh, well, sector? majority of our farmers are literate. Okay. So, so they uh, use sell. they use all this IT. I mean things to. Even determine the weather or what will happen and things like that. They mm. use it. Mm. So they will not know what to do at a particular time. So, okay, maybe because the weather is going to be hot tomorrow or something like that. Let me come to the farm. You will instruct your boys to come to the farm as early as 5 a.m. You feed the bears. Even before the sun comes out, your bears are already, are they already right. eating and they start producing. Talk about jobs. As against the... your it's normal 8 o'clock feeding and the likes. Talk, so, about, talk about jobs for the boys and the girls. Yeah, I, I, yes. Ever since we started talking with, um, with Emeka Wanchin Emery, I've just started imagining that somebody just will get a, a board and say, fans and ice block here is <laughs> <laughs> the value chain. And Certainly, that's supply. another value chain again. That's another value chain. And that, like I said, yeah. we have a lot in the, in the poultry industry, a lot of value chain yes. that we have not even explored. Yes. Which, which 80% is, yeah. or let me say 75 to 80% yes. of the turkeys that we are eating, the mm. turkey meat we eat, yeah. They are small good. So we have that gap. Which, which can be filled. Which can be filled. Massive, we have that gap. Massive. But and when you but eat a small good In terms of talking. the economic reality we face, we're facing presently, yep. in your farm and around the, the Poultry Association of Nigeria, talk, yep. talk, tell, tell us about the loss of jobs. Did you lose jobs or were you like the ICT sector where you had people even coming in? Coming in, yeah. Right now, we had a lot of farms and that size. Oh. Like my farm, we are producing half of our capacity now. We are even afraid to take uh, new birds. Why? Because of the cost of materials. For feed? For so feed. What? That's the problem. So even we are trying to talk with the Lagos State Government to do what they did for the rice. Uh, I mean, yeah, during the rice. Program for yes, CBA for rice. Okay. They can also do it for grains. That means government to government talking to the northern government to maybe even aside that we are talking about climate change we should be looking at irrigating farms even in the southwest we have a lot of lands that that can be used so as we speak most people are downsizing and you know what it means for the nation young boys mm -hmm. coming out of job is going to be a problem so we are trying to solve societal problem by employing these boys. And now we cannot sustain it. Mm. So the government needs to come to our aid. Mm. Because they might be thinking, that how do we... I mean, if they are, if they are supporting farmers indirectly, they are supporting the, 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 the society. Mm. Because sustaining our business will sustain those workers. You have maybe like 15 workers and you are asking about six to go. You know the multiplying effect. That six, about four or five people are dependent on that six. Right. We are looking at about 30. 
in a particular sector. Just like that. You multiply it in other mm. farms like that that are downsizing. So to speak. But, all right. Be before we go, as we round off on this particular talk, the, the WTO, that World Trade Organization Director General, Ngozi Okunjo Wela, mentioned something while she paid a four-day courtesy visit to the country, a working visit to the country. She said that for us to get uh, forex and to reflate our economy above the uh, recession that we just exited from, that, that we must churn out quality products in the country. Let's talk about the poultry products that we have in the country. What quality do you think we have the highest quality? Because I heard that there were times where our beans and other products were returned, our yams, supers of yams were returned because they didn't meet up with, for instance, European standards. What was the place of standardization in producing uh, in production in, in the value chain uh, in agriculture? How do we improve that as we round off on the show today? The only way to improve it is that everybody needs to be on the same page. Majority of people that are into farming, they are not into the association, so they don't know what we are doing. And even if they know what we are doing, they might not want to follow what we are doing. Most of the products that are taken abroad from Nigeria, they pass through Ghana and they go, they sail easily without any stress. Why is it that? Because Ghana, they have standards. Everybody must belong to a particular association. Whenever you are producing anything, you must belong. And you must do what everybody is doing or required to do. Mm. But in Nigeria, it's not like that. They will tell you that uh, freedom of association. You cannot force me to do. But even if you are not going to be forced into any association, you must do the right thing. Those are the people that are causing problems. In terms of people that are in our association, we make sure that we do the right thing. In terms quality of packaging, control. quality control and everything we do it. So I think that is where the government also need to come. Regulation. They need to regulate all these businesses. Right. right. It's very important. But you know, when government want to regulate, they come with money and all those kind of, uh, of uh, maybe uh, things right. that make people think that government want to make money. If right. you want to regulate, you don't need to put money first. Right. Make sure that people do the right thing so that our products can go even beyond the shores right. of this of country. country. There are plenty of food. Uh, forgive the pun for thought. <laughs> mm. Let's yes, uh, cross over to Emeka Wanchin Emere, who is going to give us his final thoughts on this topic. Emeka, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like to start with where uh, Mr. Godwin. Oh, dear. All right. Uh, we thank you. We will we'll hope we can get Emeka Wanchin Emere at some point into the studio so we can uh, trash out all of those things that he Absolutely. wants to get. He's been, he's been fantastic today. Very useful and resourceful. Emeka uh, Wanchin Emere, who is a, a value chain expert in agriculture. Thank you very much. And Godin Egbegwe, Chairman, Poultry of of Nigeria, Lagos State Chapter. Thank you very much. The last time we spoke to you, it was online. Now yeah. we're here. Yeah. And, and thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. Yep. Okay, so we go on a quick break. Uh, when we come back, um, the vaccination, COVID-19 is on. It's time for us to have uh, tour the states and see what has been happening so far. Please stay with us. <laughs> 